What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm going to introduce officially Pete Williams in a second before I do. I like to point out, Pete, some past episodes people should check out. Um, you know, some interesting ones. I love I love not just the success stories, but the the trials and tribulations stories, the challenges, right? As you know, the entrepreneurship journey is ups and downs. I remember um, people can check out the I interviewed one of the co-founders of PipeDrive. If anyone's heard of PipeDrive, it's like way you can, you know, basically have your pipeline um, in a very elegant way. Ermas actually talked about how he had brain surgery. He got married and moved from Estonia to the U.S. all in the same year. And I remember when I interviewed them, I think they were around at 10,000 paying customers. Now they have over 100,000 customers. And so they've grown tremendously. Check out um, that interview with PipeDrive. I remember also interviewing the founder of um, P90X, Tony Horton, and he talked about, you know, they've sold, who knows at this point, Pete, like hundreds of millions of dollars of Sorry. P90X. But, but the cool part is he drove cross country to California to fulfill his dream and was doing like personal training. And the way he made food and rent money was he put his hat on the street and did street mine. That's how he made his food and rent money. Did not know um, that. The humble beginnings, right? And so um, before I introduce today, uh, Pete Williams, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. I co-founded it with my business partner, John Corcoran. We help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping them run their podcast. And you know, for me, Pete, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And I've seen no better way than to profile the people I admire, their thought leadership, their businesses on my podcast and allowing other people to find out more about them. So if you are out there and you've thought about starting a podcast, you should do it. Whether we work together or not, or if you have questions, I'm happy to help. You can email me anytime. You can go to rise25.com and learn more, check out more. I'm excited. And also just a big shout out to Dean Dutro. Dean Dutro and Ryan O'Connor Introduce me to today's guest um, and their co-founders of Worth E-Commerce, which is a Portland-based email agency. So check them out. If you have an e-commerce store that does over 500,000 a year, they can help you grow it with email. And we are connected through Bruce of Oh Crap. Um, and Pete Williams is the founder of several companies. I mean, several, Pete is kind of an understatement, like <laughs> many companies. If you go to their website, you go to petewilliams.com. I love Pete on your website. You say, you know, propaganda like about Pete. That's <laughs> hilarious. It just shows your personality. But if you go to their projects, he's got so many companies that he has started or is helping, you know, Preneur Group, Infinity Telecommunications, Simply Headsets, Springcom. Um, he also has several books and we're going to talk about that. And, and Dean couldn't say enough good things about you, Pete, and about your seven lovers. So we're going to dig deep on it. He's like, everyone should read his book. I mean, you have multiple books, but Cadence and 10% Wins. Um, he's like, he's highly recommends going through and, you know, basically implementing those seven lev you know, levers in someone's business. So, you know, like I said, telecom, e-commerce, consulting company, you were Southern Region finalist in the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year program. Um, you made a name for yourself at age 21 when you sold Australia's version of Yankee Stadium, the Melbourne <laughs> yep. Cricket Ground for under $500. So if we're lucky, maybe you'll tell that story. And your latest one. book, Cadence, A Tale of Fast Business Growth. Um, it was born from the Seven Levers Framework, which you developed inside the Preneur Group. So um, Pete, thanks for joining me. Mate, looking forward to being here. Thank you so much for having me. You know, that's the part I, I don't talk the rest of the interview and you do all the talking. All right, but, um, you know, I wanted to start with um, we're going to talk about Cadence. We're going to talk about the seven levers, but, uh, and I think it relates to your telecom company and how you started that and growing that. Yeah, sure. So that, that business is, you know, that group's now about 15 years old. We've got about three or four companies in the group. You sort of mentioned a few of them before. So thank you for the, uh, the free PR. Um, so yeah, e-commerce business with the largest headset 
reseller in the country here in Australia. We've got a carrier. So let's think, you know, AT&T, but smaller. <laughs> um, and the business really started about 15 years ago, selling and installing traditional phone systems for businesses. So I've got two business partners in that company and, and they started the business a couple of years before I kind of came along and they were doing something a bit different in the telco space. And I sort of stumbled across them. We did a little bit of work together and we kind of realized there was this thing called Google that was starting to kind of take hold of the internet. It sounds really weird to kind of talk about Google in its infancy, but 15, 16 years ago, you know, it was just starting to kind of get um, really well known. And, you know, the office managers, the people who owned the small businesses, they were going to the internet to search for solutions to their problems, you know, rather than going to the yellow pages and the things that, you know, you know, we used to do back in business these days, you know, you, of course you go to Google, it's where everyone does everything these days is the internet. But um, Google was kind of starting to, to take hold in Australia. And we realized that no one was kind of marketing telecommunications products, phone systems and stuff in Australia on the web. So we kind of pivoted the business into that space. And, you know, for years and years, we could have owned early on e-commerce. Early on e-commerce, um, but also just early on lead gen as well, just purely generating leads for our physical phone system sales. Um, you know, we're not telco guys. You know, I still, 15 years on now, still don't know how to install or program a phone system. And we basically started generating the leads and we were a sales and marketing company. And we were generating the leads from, from online and we were basically, you know, selling a phone system solution to a business, you know, seven or eight handsets, whatever they needed. Uh, but what we did though is to scale the business is we actually outsourced all the actual implementation. So we were, as I said, purely sales and marketing. And that's what we really cared about was making the lead, the phone ring, and then obviously converting that sale. And we'd outsource the installation, which was great to start with. You know, we scaled very, very quickly. We could sell and support clients, you know, all around the country because we were basically just finding subcontractors everywhere to do the installation. So it was a really smart way we thought initially to basically prove the business model, prove the market and scale. And it was. But you know, a few years in, we kind of hit this glass ceiling and we weren't really growing um, our overall revenue and we were kind of sort of just you know, banging our heads against the wall, essentially. And we sort of sat back and went, okay, well, what's, what's the problem here? What, what's actually going on? And we kind of went back and go, okay, well, we, you know, we're doing really well you know, having people find us because you know, the internet, we're doing well with that. We we're doing well with our conversions and our sales pipe and all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, things like, you know, pipe drive you mentioned is, is an amazing tool to help manage your sales pro processes. And we, you know, we've, we've done stuff like that for years and did really well with that. But the more we kept analyzing, we kind of realized that, well, hang on, you know, we sold, you know, all these clients 12 months ago, none of them have come back and spent any more money with us. You know, what, what's going on there? You know, we had, you know, this, you know, hundreds and hundreds of clients every, every sort of month or so joining us. And then we kind of you know, sat back and realized that, well, actually our business model was causing this problem in that what was happening was, you know, think about it, you know, if you went out and bought a phone system for your business and someone came in and installed it with, you know, white gloves on and gave you the service and trained you and it gave you a lot sort of support, who are you going to call when you want to expand the system or make ads, moves and changes to the program? You're going to call the person who actually turned you up. You have a relationship with them, yeah. People with the screwdriver actually kind of installed it, not the company who kind of just sold you um, the solution then kind of you know passed you on. We kind of realized that was a, a, a limitation to the growth of the business. You know, the, I'm sure we've all heard it before. Like, you know, it's, it's five times easier to sell to an existing customer than a new one. Those kind of overused analogies, they're true. They're mm -hmm. overused, but they are true. <laughs> And um, sometimes we, we went, need a slap in the head and reminder of those things because we absolutely. always go after the new and shiny. And what we realize is adding value to our current clients or customers who know they can trust us is a lot easier. Absolutely. And that was the biggest problem for us is we kind of were just that naive or arrogant. I don't know which, which, which word we should use, but um, you know, hindsight kind of, you could say both um, around that. Cause we were just worried about, and we, because we were doing so well with lead gen, we kind of just thought, oh, well, the phone's ringing. We better answer that phone call for the next, next you know, new lead, next new prospect. It's a good problem and to have also. It, you know? it was a great problem yeah. to have, but you know, we didn't necessarily treat our customers you know, to the level of love that we do now. And so basically from that, we sort of sat down and went, okay, let's look at all the inputs that, that drive a business. Whether you, know, whether you are a telco business, you're an e-commerce store, you're a service provider doing... Web, you know, website design or podcasting or you're a SaaS or whatever it might be, you're a hairdresser. 
You know, let's look at all the different business models we could find and figure out what were the key drivers that drove the revenue and the profit of the business. Um, because obviously we realized, well, one of the things that we weren't thinking about was repeat business, transactions per client. So we sat down and started thinking through these. And that's kind of over a period of time. Like I'd love to say, you know, the, the hero's journey evolution stories. We sat down with a whiteboard one afternoon and came up with this mystical brand new model that changed the world. And, you know, that's never the truth. It's always the marketing story, but it's not the truth. It took us a while. But over time, we kind of realized there was seven key things that we found that kind of drove revenue for businesses that we looked at uh, and our business. And we kind of went through this and, you know, looked at all the seven areas. But, okay, that's really interesting. Let's make sure we actually spend time every month or every quarter focusing on each of these seven areas because when we do, that actually makes the impact to the profit. And then the crazy thing we actually found was that when we actually increased each of the seven areas by just 10%, like so nothing too drastic, not a, not a miracle change, just a small tweak of the dial in every area, the profit doubled. And then we'd do another round of you know, 10% wins effectively across these seven areas and profit would double again. And it just became this kind of ritual for us as these are the things we're going to focus on when we're trying to work on the business. There's still customer service to do and operational headaches and staffing and all that sort of stuff you have to do in a business to sort of run it. But when you kind of take that, you know, Michael Gerber approach of working on your business, not in it, that e-myth type of analogy, you know, I think he did a great job telling people about working on, not in, but he kind of got to tell people what to work on. He left that part of the story out of like, well, what's the areas when you work on your business? What are the things you should do? What are the dials you should be focusing on? And that's kind of what we kind of stumbled upon. It's worked really well for us across our group. And, and, and that's sort of the, the evolution of the, the telco and then sort of how that kind of parlayed into the growth of the telco and then this framework that we've uh, been able to just use over and over again. So talk about the framework a little bit, because I know yeah. you refer to the seven levers. Yeah, absolutely. So and yeah, you can this, get the this, book on Audible. I mean, people can listen to absolutely. it on Audible as well. So yep, I bought it. or 10% wins. Both of those yeah. can tell you that. Um, so fundamentally, you know, again, you, you probably hear these things and people go, oh yeah, that sort of sounds obvious. But I guess the question is the slap in the face comment that you made earlier. The question you need to ask yourself is, are you actually spending time in each of these areas? So, you know, suspects is the first one. Like how are you getting more people to know about your business? That's the advertising, that's the marketing. How are you getting awareness or traffic to your website if you're an e-commerce store, for example? Then you've got this thing, um, you know, conversions, obviously how many people actually turn around and actually from your website visitors actually convert to be a buyer. Again, they're two pretty obvious things, traffic and conversion. We hear that all the time, but there's one missing piece in between those two that a lot of people don't really take time to think about. And it's prospects. It's what's that micro commitment that people make between being a suspect and becoming a customer. You know, a really good analogy is let's say you're a clothing retailer, you know, going into the, uh, changing rooms actually trying on that dress. Uh, that's a good example of a, of a, of a micro commitment. Um, you know, in our phone system business, for example, the micro commitment is someone taking the time to actually allow us to send them a pro proposal. You know, you've got a, someone who, who calls up and inquires about the, the phone system solution, that's the suspect. And someone who buys one's obviously a conversion, but that in between, well, what's that micro commitment? Someone's willing to spend time. We qualify each other. Yeah, we could be a good fit. Here's a proposal. So I think it's really important to actually measure all of those three things, suspects, prospects, and conversions, because each of those are, are slightly different steps. And the way you communicate to a suspect is actually different to the way you talk to a prospect, for example. So there's your first three, and that's basically your sales funnel. Then you've got your revenue. So your revenue is driven by two things, average item price and items per sale. So again, it's, you, these are two distinct questions. It's like, well, are they going to buy the silver or the gold model of the product you sell. That's your price point. Can you get people to buy a higher price point item? And then can you get them to buy the fries? You know, we're using a lot of overused analogies here today, but would you like fries with that? You know, how are you getting people to buy the phone system plus the headset? How are you getting them to buy the podcast editing plus the social media snippets that you can produce as well and, and you know, people can put on their, on their Twitters or their Instagrams or Facebooks. You know, um, I just you selling... had someone text me, ask me for that today. Perfect. It's funny, that's, that's, funny thing you say that. That's it. Yeah. Well, that's your items per sale. Getting yeah. people to buy more than just the core yeah. product. You know, As the hairdresser, how do you get them to get the haircut, but also buy the shampoo to take home and use as well? Um, so you know, that's that what drives your revenue is items per sale and average item price. You've got the transactions. Obviously, we've spoke about that before. About you know, That's where our biggest embarrassment was, is we just 
if we're ignoring our clients. So what systems and processes do you have in place in your business? Whether you're using that, the email tool that you mentioned earlier that can, you know, drive traffic back to your e-commerce store. You know, email has been massive for us in our e-commerce divisions around driving repeat business. We've got some really good automated emails that go out off the back of someone making a purchase to get them to come back and buy again. It's automated, it's systemated. Uh, and then you've got your margins. Obviously, what are you doing to drive the margins in your business? Not just your gross profit, but costs and production and stuff like that. So, you know, there's your seven levers, really. It, it's nothing really remarkable when you sit down and just hear it. Suspects, prospects, conversions, average item price, items per sale, transactions and margins. They're your seven areas. But the biggest thing, you know, is that 10% win is, you know, rather than having to try and, oh, I've got to double my business. I've got to double my traffic. I've got to get twice as many people to my website. That's damn hard work. You know, try to double anything. But okay, well, going from 1,000 visitors a week to 1,100. Well, that's just, that's just maybe some tweaking some AdWords copy or doing a little bit of SEO or finding one more avenue to drive traffic. It's not a hard task to get a 10% win in there. Increasing your conversion rate from 22% to 24.5%. You know, small tweaks on your landing page and your copy, testing the color of your buttons on your website. Some of these small things can make massive changes. You know, there was a, a newspaper in the UK who was looking at doing some, um, some conversion optimization and sort of looking at how they can increase their subscribers online. And all they did was put some trust logos, you know, secure shopping and trust logos on their order form and it increased their conversion rate by 12%. You know, some very small tweaks can get those 10% wins. And then when you look at them across all seven areas, because you've spent time focusing on every area individually, that adds up to a doubling of your profit. It's quite incredible. It's um, basic math, but seven small 10% wins, which are much more accessible and easy to achieve compared to trying to double something, double your conversion rate or double your traffic. Um, it actually gives you a much better impact. Uh, and that kind of is the framework that we continually work through is just focusing on those seven areas religiously, everyone, and just keep you know, cycling through them. You know, Pete, um, I would love to hear your structure for going through them as a business. Do you, how often do you revisit those? I'm wondering your format. Um, do you have, you know, departments go, okay, this month, look at the conversions and you're in charge of 10%. How does that work on a granular level within your yeah, company? Good question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so what we try and do is we have the schedule changes differently based on the business and you know the size of the business. Obviously, the bigger the business, the, the harder it becomes to kind of find those 10% wins because you may have already looked at them for three or four years. But fundamentally, we try and have a schedule, whether it's monthly or quarterly or weekly, depending on, on the maturity of the business and how far we are down the play, but effectively let's say it's monthly. So every seven months we're trying to double the profit overall. So at the start You're of the like, month- You're like, I'm going to do it daily. I want to double the profit daily. No, I'm just going to, yeah. Not but to, hey, month, for some monthly, businesses it's possible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you're a brand new business, haven't done a whole lot, then obviously there's a lot more opportunities. So it can work. So literally we'll sit down at the start of the month and we'll go, okay, this month is prospect month. <laughs> um, and we'll literally you know, get, get in the boardroom with the marketing team or the sales team or whoever's relevant to that particular part of the business. And we'll brainstorm, okay, what are the, what's the stuff we can do this month to increase the number of prospects we get? Um, and it might be, okay, well, you know, in our e-commerce business, for example, we define a prospect as someone who actually clicks the add to cart button. So they're on their website and they've basically taken a product off the shelf and put it in their shopping trolley, the digital version of that. You know, every business has a different definition of a prospect. You know, the phone system, when I said before, was someone who calls for a proposal. Um, you know, someone getting a free quote for a, lawn mowing business might be their version of a prospect. So you've got to define what it is for you first, but then we'll say, okay, well, it's about someone who adds to cart. All right, let's look at our e-commerce store layout. What are we going to do this month to try and add, click add more ads to cart? Are we going to change the position of the add to cart button? Are we going to change the size of it, the color of it? Are we going to reposition the pricing page? We'll, we'll just look at what we can split test in that regard. You know, the next month in another division of the business, you know, we might be looking at Conversion. So how do we, you know, increase the conversion rate? Well, okay, let's review our proposals because, you know, someone who becomes a prospect has received a proposal for a phone system lead or another business. Let's look at how we can change our proposals up because the more we can give validation about our business and our offerings and our proposals, the more likely someone's going to go from a prospect to a conversion. So adding images, changing the copy. Well, what other systems do we have in place that automate you know, follow up between a prospect and a conversion. Once they've received the proposal, what automation do we have? What 
pipe drive system we have in place to actually make sure that our sales team is actually managing the pipe from prospect to conversion? How are we putting a better follow-up in? Do we add a text message or a, an alert in that process to at seven days, the person gets a text message to say, hey, you know, I hope the proposal's gone well. I'd love to answer any questions you've got. Like little things like that. And we basically try and go, okay, let's brain dump all the ideas we have for a 10% win this month. Um, and then fundamentally, it's a bit of a session where it's, you know, no negative. It's like you, you can't pull someone's idea apart. It's just like, let's throw up all the ideas. And then effectively, it's a bit of a voting system almost. Okay, we then discuss which one do we think is going to have the more impact. You know, obviously, we try and go for a, a bigger win than a 10% win, but we try and find that impact. And then it's like, okay, now we've got three weeks to implement it and track it and test it. And then basically next month, it's the same thing again. Next lever come together, think of the ideas, pick the best one, implement it, rinse and repeat. And it's just, so there's that one project every month, you know, yeah. because I think- It's like a four week sprint. It's a four week sprint, yeah. exactly right. And, and we're not trying to do stuff that's going to take 30 days of someone's time to implement because they've got other stuff to do. You're still running your business. You still have to, you know, maintain previous things you've implemented. Sometimes you might've done something and it's broke or, you know, staff have stuff to do. You know, no one's just sitting here going, my whole job is just to implement seven levers ideas. Like that's just- It could be. It could be. (laughs) Yeah. But I think business doesn't work like that in the real world. We've got to be realistic about it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that. It's like, okay, let's find something that's going to, that's the project for the month. You still got all your normal duties you got to do on a daily basis to you know, have the business continually run, but it's one project. Let's implement one project a month. It's a four week sprint. It's a perfect way of looking at it. I'm curious um, if you take me to one of these brainstorming sessions on a yeah. fly in the wall. And, you know, I love your rule for brainstorming is just get everything out. Don't shoot down ideas because that's what brainstorming is. One idea that maybe seems crazy actually leads to another idea that's amazing. So you just don't want to shut people down from sharing. But I'm wondering what ideas, um, when you put it on the wall with post-its or whatever it is, and then you voted on it, maybe one of these, it wasn't the one you voted on. Like maybe you voted on a different one that turned out really, really good. that came from someone else? Like what was one of those things that made it to the top? Most of my ideas get, most of my <laughs> ideas that have voted. Um, for whatever reason, the, the one that comes to my mind was years ago with the headset business was the color of the site. Like there was a discussion that we should make the colors more pinkish. And, and, and I'm like, oh, I, can't, I, can't, I think the site was green at the time from memory. I can't remember, but I remember that people were like, we should change the color. And I'm like, really? Like, what like change like the general theme of the site? I'm like, I don't know. Like that doesn't. I just couldn't quite grasp that at the time. And you know, there was some arguments about like we you know our, our our demographics female generally for headsets. It's the office manager, and not trying to be sexist. That's just the demographic data that the office managers or the wife of the business owner is the person who's buying the headsets. Just seems to be that way, or at least was at the time. So like, let's make it pink. And I'm like, do do do. The women going to buy more because it's pink? I couldn't see that. Anyway, the team said, yeah, let's try it. I'm like, all right. And it's been basically pink ever since, pinky purplish ever since. So that's kind of one example of where it's outvoted. And we do that. We sort of, you know, there's this. Any others method. that surprised you? I love that. That you know, like, um, it's pink. Oh. You're like, ah, I guess that's what we voted on. We'll, we'll try it. And yeah, it's um, a bit uh, was... surprising. What other sort of stuff has been weird? Um, Trying to think across the- maybe in the maybe in the margins perspective because yeah, that, that, also- you know what I like about when you talk is you're talking in profit, not like just mm. increasing overall sales, which you can be a vanity metric. So Absolutely. you know maybe talk about the mar what's what's helped shift yeah. and improve margins. Oh, I think the biggest one for us is something that one of my business partners seems to have stumbled upon and is genius at is this concept that we've kind of termed. Um, target rebates. Now, I don't know if that's really a technical term or just a term we kind of use internally. But so one of the things we did early on is, you know, obviously trying to get a 10% win in our margins is obviously reducing costs, obviously. Um, so, so how do we get better buying? And, you know, our suppliers at the time, this, this applies to so many businesses now, and I've seen it work so often, is that, you know, suppliers are like, well, you're not doing enough volume. We can't give you the price break until you hit the next volume of revenue or sorry, purchasing. Um, so, what we were able to negotiate with a number of our suppliers and basically make it part of our standard 
negotiation these days is that it's like, okay, great. Well, we're currently on bronze pricing, for example. Now you're saying we can't hit silver until we do a million dollars worth of purchasing. Okay, well, let's negotiate that if we hit that in this calendar year, don't give us the pricing now, but if we hit it, rebate us for the entire year's worth of revenue back to that point as if we were from silver from day one. You know, and it's you know it's in their incentive because they want to incentivize us to to sell more. There's no risk on the on the wholesaler or our, our supplier's path because from their perspective it's like, well, they're not giving us the discount up front. Because you know no one's going to give you a discount front going, well, oh, I promise I'll sell you a mil- buy a million dollars from you. So give me the discount today. No supplier's going to believe that because what happens if you don't? They're screwed. But if you say, well let's risk reverse it, you know, it's forced savings on us. We'll pay the normal bronze pricing all year, but on you know January 1st or July 1st, whatever your financial year is, that if we've now looked back and sold the million dollars or bought a million dollars worth of product from you, we want the rebate to silver pricing for the entire year. Um, that's been one of the really cool tactics that's worked immensely well for us to sort of be able to you know, pre-plan that 10% win in margins without having to you know, force the suppliers to do something that's you know, not really... Um, in their best interest to start with. So you can all email Pete when you do this <laughs> and you get you know, a lot of savings straight to the bottom line, right? So people, first of all, you can find them petewilliams.com.au um, yeah. and you, there's a contact page. So if you do this, yeah, please, which, you know, message him and let him know. You know, you mentioned something. I think this could be your, you know, a whole book that you write, um, which you talk about micro commitment. You know, yeah. I would read a book that you wrote about micro commitment. You know, I think, you know, Robert Cialdini, I think talked about an influence. What are some yeah. interesting micro commitments? Cause I know that a lot of people come to you for advice and not just the companies you run, but a lot of advice. Are there any that stick out that you said, you know, you need to implement this, these micro commitments and, um, you know, I remember listening to um, Andre Chaperon. I don't know if you've you've listened to or read his work, uh, Autoresponder Madness, just like an amazing yeah. email copywriter. And he basically has these micro commitments at the bottom of each page. You have to click to see the next page as, as yeah. opposed to scrolling down and making you make that, that micro commitment. So Absolutely. what are some that stick out to you that maybe be, kind of get people's juices flowing? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's, yeah, some obvious ones as well. It's like, you know, how do you get someone to do a taste test of your product? How do you get them to sort of, you know, you go to the supermarket, you've got those little sample t- taste tests. There's a reason for that. It's like, that's a micro commitment. You've kind of gone, oh, well, I'll, I'll taste that food. Yeah, I might now buy it. It's, you're getting a step closer to the purchase. And I think, you know, every business has that. There's some sort of step you take when you, 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 you go from being a tire kicker to a qualified buyer and it's what is that now you know trying on a pair of shoes you know i grew up um you, during college selling shoes at athletes foot that was sort of the job i i i did and you know we were taught fundamentally our first role as a salesperson at athletes foot was not to sell them a pair of shoes to get them to try on a pair of shoes that was the first sale we need to actually make so that was that micro commitment if they're going to sit down and try on a pair of shoes they're more likely to buy a pair trying on a dress in a clothing store um you know, allowing you to send a proposal. It's, you know, taking that free two minute massage at the local fair. It's, you know, what's those small things that actually, and everyone does them, you know, there's some sort of commitment you actually make, you know, going for a test drive in a car at a car yard, you know, every business, there is some sort of small commitment that you can make or that you do make mentally as you get closer to actually making a purchase. Yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, it's it's a little bit hazy for me, Pete, as far as influence of Cialdini. So people are going to have to fact check this, but I think that they went around and had people sign up a petition, and then later they went with like an obnoxious sign to put on the people's lawns. They already yes. made the micro commitment of signing the, if I'm correct, you know that yep, petition, and they, and they come back with a bigger ask, which is like. I forgot the percentage conversion to yeah. just going up. Hey, can I put this huge obnoxious sign on your lawn compared yep. to they sign a petition and then ask for the sign on the lawn? Something yeah, it was, like it was, that. I think, I think like it was, that. it was a, um, they asked you just to, to, to sign and support a cause. Exactly. Something and then like it was that. now, now yeah. put the sign in the front of your yard to promote the cause. Whereas right. it's going exactly. for the cold ask of promote the cause. 
much, much different. Yeah. So yeah, like it's, it's, it's incredible how that sort of stuff makes a difference. And there was, you know, there's, I think the other example in the book was um, where, you know, they were giving flowers and then asking for a donation after the fact. So it's that kind of, well, that's reciprocity. Right. Is, yeah. It was, it was it's it's kind of a version. combination. It's yeah. It's mm. like people want to be congruent with their, yeah. their actions. And so, but there is a reciprocity piece to, yeah. to that micro commitment as well. Um, yeah. And so well, yeah, even to downloading a free report before buying the course or the book, like, you know, there's, there's an argument, there's, there's two arguments there. One is you're building a database, but really if someone's going to be, going to be willing to download the free thing that you're offering, that is a micro commitment to show that they actually are seriously interested in potentially consuming content around this. Therefore, they're more likely to buy it. You know, the $1 trial at Netflix, it's that small commitment to sort of show that they are going to take that the next step. So. Yeah. And I want to, you know, it's probably an amazing story as far as, you know, so, you know, selling Australia's version of Yankee stadium. <laughs> and I want to get there for a second, but, but I'm just curious for you, Pete, you know, when you were young, what did you want to do when you grew up? Obviously, you're very entrepreneurial with all the boys. companies and books. What, what did you want to do when you were younger? So always been businessy. I, my, mom tell, my mom tells this story that she just loves. But apparently, I was like two or three years old and I drew arrows in, in crayon all the way down the hallway wall. And to my mom's credit, apparently now, this is the way she tells the story today. So I don't know how true it is, but I'll, I'll tell her version of the stories. She didn't yell at me. She didn't tell me off first. She calmly first asked me, why did I draw the arrows? Um, my mom being a teacher, maybe that was her teacher, teacher sort of side coming out. And apparently my answer to the question of why I drew arrows down the hallway at three years old was to say to my mom, so you can find my office. Hmm. So I think I've always been that way inclined. I remember, you know, I was basketball was, I was obsessed with basketball. We were very involved in community basketball and um, some professional basketball teams and things like that. So my dream was as much as I loved playing basketball, was involved in basketball. Um, my dream was to be an agent. So like when Jerry, even before Jerry Maguire, when Jerry Maguire, the movie came out, that was like, that's me. I want to be um, that agent. And you know, I was able to talk my way into some work experience when I was 16 or 17 at one of Melbourne's largest um, or Australia's largest agents. And I did some work experience there. And I remember they said to me, come back anytime you want. And we'll, you know, I must have impressed them somehow. They said, come back anytime you want. Well, you know, we don't normally do work experience, but you, every school holidays, you're, you're more than welcome to come back and work here and you know, um, get experience. And I, uh, I never did. I don't know why. I think I was naive, young, nervous, embarrassed. I don't know what it was, but um, yeah, that was the dream that I never quite fulfilled. Is that how you met Bruce through basketball? Absolutely. Because he played yeah. professional basketball. Yeah. He actually so, gave me some tips and tricks on how to shoot better. There you go. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so Bruce, so, oh crap. So I, I'm, I advise and work with him now, but I've known Bruce since I was about seven. So that's a crazy story. It's really? right. Yeah. So when I first started playing basketball, the number I was given was number nine just random. That was the, the uniform number I was given from the team. So my mom made me this sort of jumpsuit, I guess you call it with number nine on the back. Like this is the eighties. Like it's terribly lame now. You would not be <laughs> seen dead picture, in it. I can but picture like a full jumpsuit. Blue shiny jumpsuit with a big number nine on the back that I used to wear to basketball training. Just like complete door, like absolute door. That's what I did. So anyway, <laughs> I used to wear that as well to go to professional basketball games as a fan, just because it was my basketball jumper. And Bruce was number nine for a club called the Geelong Supercats, which we used to go and visit. So, and you know, I love Bruce to death. Don't get me wrong. Like, you were his biggest fan, but it's yeah. random. <laughs> I love, like Bruce was like, and uh, Bruce will be the first to tell you this. I'm sure he's like, he was not a superstar. He was a good professional basketball player and had a good six or seven year career, but he was a sixth, seventh man on the bench. He was never, he was not a starting five player, but he was a good role player and great at his role. So like for him to have some little kid running around the stadium with his number on his back was just, the bee's knees. So that's how he met Bruce is I'd go to the games, we're in that jumper and he was number nine. So it's like, we're cool. He was like, you know, I was like seven or eight. He was in his twenties and you know, I'd be like, can I get the ball back? And he'd shoot game, shoot before the game. And I'd run around the court, throw the ball back to him and stuff. And we just built a family relationship since then. And we've been just, yeah, family's been connected since then just purely because I ran, he was given number nine on my um, very first basketball team and mum made me the most embarrassing jumpsuit in hindsight. I want a picture of that for this, uh, for this post. We'll try and uh, find it. I think I'm sure we've, got, we've, got a, we've definitely got photos of me and him back in the age. I don't know if we've got a photo of me in that jumpsuit. Right. I need to see the jumpsuit. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask mum. <laughs> fast forward to your 21. Yeah. 
So the MCG story. So this is the MCG here. If you're watching on video, there's that's a photo um, in my office with the whole mural of Melbourne behind me. Um, so I just got back from working in America. So as I said before, during university and my college days, I worked at Athletes Foot. And when I graduated, I somehow taught my way into getting a, a six-month um, working visa with Athletes Foot in America. Uh, and the plan was to come across, start in Fort Lauderdale, and then work my way back across the country, across different Athletes Foot stores, back to LA, and then fly home. You know, a bit of a reconnaissance mission, I guess you'd call it, to kind of see what you guys were doing differently over there compared to back here in Australia. So 21-year-old Aussie accent, landed in Fort Lauderdale, you know, an hour or so or less from Miami, South Beach. You know, I basically stayed in the one spot for six months. I didn't leave. Had a great time. Um, and then when I, I fell in love, met a girl while I was over there and my visa ran out. So I came back to Australia with plans of going back to the US. So while I was trying to figure out a way to get back and get a new work visa, um, a new athlete's foot store had opened up. So I went and actually managed that or worked in there for, for six months. And it was, it was a very quiet store, not a lot of foot traffic, pardon the pun. Um, so I'd spend time behind the counters reading books um, until people came in. And one of the books I read was called The One Minute Millionaire by Robert Allen and Mark Victor Hansen. I remember um, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I wouldn't recommend people necessarily go out and buy it now. It's an interesting read. If you've got some time, check it out. But I wouldn't put it at the top of your reading list. However, in like one chapter on like one, par one paragraph almost on one page, it just mentions this story of a guy in the 80s who bought all the timber that was part of the Brooklyn Bridge walkway. Mm. And rumor has it is he made like a million dollars selling these little certificates up of the Brooklyn bridge with an inch by inch piece of the timber from the walkway. And I'm like, that's a bloody good idea. How do I take that and do it here in Australia? So I started thinking like what's going on and the MCG, you know, as you said before, Australia Yankee stadium, it's a hundred thousand seat sporting stadium. It's where the Australia Aussie rules football grand final is every year. It's just, it's the Mecca of sport in Australia. Anyway, part of the stadium had just been pulled down like, you know, weeks before for a redevelopment. And I remember going to footy with my dad and sitting on these really hard, uncomfortable wooden seats. Um, and I'm like, that's my ticket. That's my opportunity. So made some phone calls and actually Bruce, who you talked about before, actually kind of helped me out with this project as well. So this is just getting very incestual. Um, so we made a few phone calls. We found the wrecking company company that was doing the demolition uh, of the MCG and said, hey, do you guys have some of the timber still from the, the wrecking? And they're like, yeah, we've got some of the timber. It's just in the back of the warehouse. But we've also got this carpet. It sounds really weird, but the Melbourne Cricket Club, which is a section of the stadium, is really quite famous. It's like a 50-year wait list to become a member. It's a rite of passage. If you have a son or a daughter, you basically, you put them on the wait list and then, you know, when they turn 30 or 40 or 50, they get to become a member and then you get to go to any event at the stadium, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, the carpet of the members area of this part of the grandstand is really famous. It's terribly ugly. It's got it's red and blue. It has the logo of the MCCC on it. So it's really well known in Australia. Anyway, these wrecking companies said, we've actually got a lot of the carpet as well. It was in the dining room. It's just sitting in the back of the warehouse. And I'm like, oh, hang on a second. That's just even more valuable and more recognizable. So I literally was like, all right, I'll buy it all over the phone. We bought it all. And fundamentally made a series of memorabilia pieces up with a photo of the MCG, a piece of this really famous carpet and a plaque. And then, you know, I was up to my nose in credit card death, debt, sorry, not death, well, death and debt. Um, you know, South Beach cocktails are not cheap for a 21 year old and six months of them, you know, it was a lot of credit card debt. So you couldn't sort of do any marketing at the time. So I just wrote a press release. 21 year old sells the MCG for 500 bucks and it went bananas here in Australia, you know, news, TV, print, and basically just sold, you know, a, a series of memorabilia pieces, which was effectively, you know, Australia's sporting mecca. That's amazing. That was, How did yeah, you decide what to charge people? for that good question piece. i think it was probably <sighs> and then when you offer to buy mm -hmm. did they even know what to sell it to you for i mean what like, <sighs> i was oh, i was nothing I mean, it was, I, we borrowed, I literally borrowed a friend's credit card to make to do it yeah. um it was a few thousand dollars because like yeah. they're they're in the business of wrecking they don't they yeah. don't understand that they were just like well it's sitting here we're not going to get rid of it but we don't know what to do with it really so um 
well, there's actually early talks. We actually filmed a pilot for a documentary about this whole thing a couple of weeks ago. So there could be something really cool coming out telling the whole story because um, someone else also at the same time had the same idea. And there's a bit of a battle because we were both trying to sell it, both 21. It's a whole nother story. It's really cool. But in terms of, you know, they just sort of went, oh, you know, here's a price, X thousand dollars. And I'm like, done. Because they didn't have any value for it. Like they, they kind of assumed I was just going to, you know, carpet a, a a pool room or a, a man cave or something like that, you know, rather than actually sell it off. I didn't necessarily tell them what I was doing with it. I thought I'd better keep that bit private. In terms of pricing, look, I don't think there was any great science behind it, to be honest. I think it was pretty much um, a mixture of what's it going to cost to make the frames. And well, let's try and keep it under 500 bucks. So it's a price point that people will buy and it's a good story. So I think it was just more of a finger in the air price point at the time. Yeah. I was 21. You know, I don't think there was any too much science behind it. Um, but it was a great little project and just, yeah, you know, got my first book deal off the back of it, telling the whole story and um, the whole, that whole venture in its own right has so many little curves and, and ups and downs and, you know, got a cease and desist letter from the MCG at one point and right. you know, the whole, it was Jeez. outsourced because I was, I was still working athletes at the time. So literally the framing company, I dump carpet at the framers, someone would fax through an order or phone an order. This is literally, this is, you know, 20 years ago. So faxes, orders coming through. And they'd be like, John, we had two more orders today. Can you please make two more frames? So I get paid, charge a credit card, then make the frame. So it was cash flow positive business from day one. It was brilliant. You were like set up whole drop shipping. Yeah, out of sheer business. dumb luck. I'd love to be able to think that I was, you know, you know I was this brilliant mind. I had this whole thing planned, but it was literally like, well, I can't afford to pay for the framing first. So let me just make the orders and and I'll oh, make the sale. I'll tell the person that, look, you know, it's going to take a couple of weeks to make the frames because, you know, they're all being handmade and it's timing. So it wasn't sort of trying to bluff anybody. They knew that they were prepaying to secure their piece and to get delivered in a couple of weeks' time. So I'd charge the client 500 bucks. I'd tell John, make the frame. He'd go and make the frame. He'd then invoice me after the fact. The courier company would go and pick it up and deliver it to the person. I'd literally just be either at, at Athletes for it at home kind of in my underwear um, with this positive cash flow business out of sheer dumb luck. Um, and that's kind of, I guess, you know, why we built the telco the way we did as well. Because I kind of realized after the fact with the MCG project that the way that was built because of sheer necessity was actually a nice business model. Make the sale, get paid, get someone else to do the actual effort and delivery. So that's kind of how the telco yeah. kind of model um, came about as well. It we sort of went, oh, that was actually good. There was some underlying intelligence in there we didn't realize at the time let's parlay that into the telco but then obviously the the, the glass ceiling issue that we spoke about early happened as well so i love that story yeah. pete uh you know when the documentary comes out if and when it comes out i look forward to watching it um i have one last question pete and first of all thanks thanks for sharing your experience the seven lovers and you know it's a framework i think anyone can follow and execute on piece mm -hmm. by piece um every month and and start to improve their business um before i ask the last question i want to point people towards petewilliams.com .au um yep. and to check out your books you know if you go to the the page there's a books tab you can check out the books the books are also on audible and amazon you know he has cadence he has 10 percent wins He's got other books, you know, that actually precede that as well that you could check read, out. Those ones suck. Don't read the early, the early ones suck. Just read Cadence or 10% Wins. The early ones um, <laughs> where else should we point people towards online to learn more, check out more about it? Yeah, you? well, sevenlevers.com is being rebuilt at the moment. So if you get, head over to sevenlevers.com um, shortly, there'll be a brand new website there with a whole bunch of resources and stuff to help people around that framework. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter at atpreneur, P-R-E-N. E U R. It's probably the best places to okay. uh, to to hang out and um, connect with me. And yeah, okay. let me know the crazy stories. If anyone does get some ten percent wins, I love hearing crazy stories about what people have done. You know, I heard this story the other day that there's this research being done in the UK where they've been testing what music plays in fast food outlets and how that affects orders. And apparently, Ed, Ed Sheeran makes people people buy more desserts than any other musician. Really. Bizarre, like wow. playing Ed Sheeran increased dessert sales by like 8%. Like crazy stories. It's really cool. Here's some really fit, funky, different examples of how people have had their 10% wins. I love that. Yeah. So play Ed Sheeran if you're a restaurant. That's it. Um, so check out sevenlevers.com, <laughs> petewilliams.com. Check out the books. Um, last question, Pete. You know, I got your book on Audible. Love it. I'm curious, some of your favorite business books outside of the ones that you've written. Oh, good questions. 
All right. So I have a bit of a pile next to my desk of stuff that I actually give out. Take a look. So yeah. I've got Trillion Dollar Coach is a book I give out a lot. Hmm. So I love that. Who wrote that? Really book. Um, Eric Schmidt and Jonathan Rosenberg. They hmm. are the guys from Google. So they wrote How Google Works and they wrote Trillion Dollar Coach. It's a book about a guy called Bill Campbell who was kind of like the business coach to some of the biggest minds in Silicon Valley. So he was awesome. Um, another book I give out a lot, hence why I've got a bunch of copies, is My Life in Advertising. I can't, you probably can't see that easily with the light, but My Li- Life in Advertising. Um, Claude Hopkins? By Claude Hopkins. Oh, yep. yeah. yeah. Old school copywriter. Love it. That's brilliant. Um, this is one of my favorite books last year, Thinking in Bets mm. by Annie Duke. She's a, a poker player. Yeah. Um, and she wrote this book about thinking in bets and this whole concept of resulting and this thinking about that, you know, we often in hindsight, look at a decision we made based on the result, not based on the logic of the decision in that in poker, you could play the mathematically smart hand and still lose. And in poker, some people say, oh, I shouldn't have played that hand because I lost. Well, no, you should have played that hand because mathematically it was the right hand to play. Don't, allow the result to change and in hindsight affect your decision making. So that's, a, that's kind of the, I guess the theme Love of the book. That. It's really cool. Um, By the way, when they're, asking they're this question, there. I had no idea you had piles of books around you just so you know. I give but, out a lot of books. But yeah, a lot keep of books go, yeah, keep going. If you have other ones. I, um, I'm well, nothing here. No. My home, I'm trying to get my home off. I've got, I've got some other piles. Blue Fish by Steve Sims. Yeah. The book. Um, Steve Sims is a guest, been a guest on the podcast awesome. and has talked about blue. Yeah, blue fish. Yeah, that's a really good book. Um, I'm trying to think what else I bought recently that I've been giving out to people. Um, I'll promote one of my friends' books that yeah. I think's new. Like, comment, share, and buy. It's a guy called Jonathan Creek who's a, a video um, editor and marketing guy. So this book's really interesting. It talks about video storytelling and how to kind of mm, tell and craft cool. really short stories. So social media video stories, not kind of talking about nice. how do you make a, a one hour documentary. It's how do you create short snapshot snippets of video that are engaging with people. So like, comment, share, buy. Were you listening to any, the, you mentioned the, the one minute millionaire when you were a young entrepreneur, were there any of your favorites old school wise? Cialdini, definitely Cialdini. Um, was a big one. Um, yeah. Um, what other stuff I listen to? Kier, like it was all like Kiyosaki, you know, so Rich Dad, Poor Dad back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, One Minute Millionaire, definitely listened to that a few times, obviously. Um, let me go to my audio books and see what else I've listened to recently because I, um, let me see what's on here that's worth listening to. Yeah. I'd, I'd say a school book recently from Harvey McKay called Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. So this is like from the, like the 90s, I think, either. Late I listened, 90s, to, I listened to Harvey McKay um, on, on audio cassette tape. Yeah. I, I used to listen to his stuff. Um, and I think he had, um, I, I'm trying to see which, which books it was, but yeah. W- which was the one you, you listened to? Dig Your Well Before oh. You're Thirsty. It's, um, it's about networking and relationships. Yeah. So that was really interesting. Um, yeah. another one, I, I remember but, swim with the sharks, uh, without yes. being eaten alive. Yeah. And I can't remember, did he do what you don't learn in Harvard business school? Or maybe that was I someone th- else. Ooh, that that might've been him. Maybe it was swim, maybe it was swim with the sharks. Anyways, swim, swim with the sharks is definitely him. Yeah. Another one I loved late last year was psychology of money. Yeah. That was a really good book hmm. by Morgan Hassel. Hassel. Um, I, I have four credits in my audible account. So these are, this yeah. would be good. I'll, I'll be sick. That is ones. Um, yeah, that's, that's the stuff that kind of sticks out yeah. to me with recent no, stuff. No, I love it. No, I love it. Checking out. Check out that. Check out more. Check out, you know, PeteWilliams.com. <laughs> you know, go and check out Cadence. Um, highly recommended. Highly recommended myself. Highly recommended by Dean Ducho, who I, hi, you know, respect uh, from Worthy Commerce. And uh, check out other episodes of the podcast. Pete, I want to be the first one to thank you. Uh, this was awesome. Thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you so much for having me. Anytime.